Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts of Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. You'll also find our archives, where you can listen to every episode we've ever done, going back to 2006. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Today is November 16th, 2017, and my guest is economist and author John Kogan. He is the Leonard and Shirley Eli Senior Fellow at Stanford University's Hoover Institution. His latest book, which is the topic of today's conversation, is The High Cost of Good Intentions, A History of U.S. Federal Entitlement Programs. John appeared previously on Econ Talk in July of 2006, talking about healthcare, which was the 12th episode of Econ Talk. John, it's been a long time, although we've talked since then, but it's a long time since. Uh, Having you on the program, welcome back. Well, thank you, Russ. I, uh, I'm delighted to be back, and and I assure you um, that I have been doing some work besides this project <laughs> between 2006 and now. But I bet it doesn't but feel I'm, that way. Pardon me. I bet it doesn't feel that way. <laughs> it's, a, it's a big book. <laughs> no, it doesn't. But I am I am delighted to be back on your show, uh, and uh, let's go ahead. So I said it's a big book. I don't want to discourage any purchasers or readers. It's not super long. It's uh, a little under 400 pages, but it's a very comprehensive and a remarkably clearly written book on the history of uh, the federal government's role in in transferring money to various uh, classes of American citizens. And I learned a great deal from it. I want to start with the beginning, which I knew very little about. Uh, The beginning of federal government entitlements is pensions for war veterans. Take us back to the beginning. Well, that's right, Russ. You know, most people think that the um, uh, sort of entitlements began with the uh, New Deal, but it turns out that entitlements are as old as the Republic. And as you said, the first entitlement program was a disability pension program for wartime uh, uh, veterans of the Revolutionary War. Um, And it was followed, of course, uh, by uh, similar programs for uh, persons who were disabled during wartime service uh, in each of the subsequent wars uh, during the uh, 19th century. But the Revolutionary War program sort of set the patterns that all entitlements follow. Um, uh, What you see in the Revolutionary War pension program is – Almost uh, exactly what you see in uh, modern entitlements, all of the same patterns, an incremental expansion of benefits occurring usually when there are times of budget surpluses. A, uh, each expansion tends to be permanent, uh, and uh, therefore uh, when Congress uh, considers a subsequent expansion, it regards all previous expansions as a base upon which to consider the next expansion. And then finally, uh, Congress has shown its uh, shows its inability to um, estimate just how much uh, these entitlement programs uh, are going to cost. So everything that you see in modern entitlements we see in the uh, Revolutionary War pension program. And then we see it in 1812, and then we see it in the Civil War. Um, the the part that's interesting to me is that it starts off. Let's talk about how the eligibility evolves over time. So it starts off if you were hurt in the war, you get you get a check, which a lot of people thought that seems fair. You signed up for, or in those in those days, you signed up. You didn't expect to get hurt. You knew you could, but if you did, it seemed pretty reasonable that that you'd get compensated extra above and beyond whatever your pay was. Yes, that's correct. The The Revolutionary War uh, pension program started out actually with a fairly narrowly defined group of veterans. As you said, it was those that had been injured uh, in battle um, or the widows of those that had lost their life in battle. Uh, but the only group that was eligible among those disabled veterans were those that had served in the Continental Army or the Continental Navy. Uh, members of the militia or volunteers were not eligible. They were a, a state responsibility. The Continental Army was the federal responsibility. 
Uh, but 20 years after the program had started, uh, Congress was uh, 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 experiencing large budget surpluses, uh, and uh, the program was expanded to include uh, veterans who had uh, served in the militia uh, or who had volunteered uh, for service uh, during the War of Independence. And then about 20, uh, 10 years after that, another expansion occurred. And then the final liberalization is perhaps the most interesting one. Uh, it occurred in 1832, and it was the Universal Pension Law, and it granted uh, disability pensions to any soldier who had served during the Revolutionary War in any capacity for uh, at least uh, nine months. Uh, and so he had gone from a from a program where the group of eligible recipients was pretty narrowly defined uh, to one where eligibility was simply service uh, to one's uh, country, uh, regardless of the capacity in which you served and regardless of whether one was disabled uh, or not. And of course, at that That's point, there weren't so many of them left. So it was a well, relatively inexpensive expansion. Well, one would have thought so. Um, <laughs> you know, 1832. 1832 was 49 years after the Revolutionary War had ended. I think uh, life expectancy was around uh, age 65, maybe. Uh, and uh, the typical veteran would have been in his 70s at that point. And so you're right. The, 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 um, uh, the architects of the law thought there would be very few uh, recipients uh, around to collect benefits. Lo and behold, uh, a, a flood of applicants came in. I think the, the numbers are as follows. Um, uh, the architects expected about 10,000 uh, uh, soldiers to, uh, to apply and qualify. Uh, a year later, uh, 24,600 had qualified uh, for benefits. And so that, like in modern entitlements, they had uh, completely underestimated uh, the number of soldiers who would eventually uh, receive uh, benefits. I think the, uh, the cost of that was that program was extraordinarily high. In, in 1833, Revolutionary War pensions accounted for about one-fourth of, of federal uh, spending. You know, there's a, a funny quote that I have in my, my book from John Quincy Adams about this remarkable uh, number of veterans who came forth to claim benefits. And his quote goes as follows. He says, Uriah Tracy, Uriah Tracy was his friend and a former senator, but Uriah Tracy used to say that the soldiers of the Revolutionary War never die, that they are <laughs> immortal. Had he lived to this time, he would have seen – that they multiply with time. <laughs> so, <laughs> so some of that was just bad actuarial estimates. Some of it was fraud, presumably. Uh, and some of it just was a surprise at how many people were willing to go through whatever the process was of applying. And that's, that's a very important point you just made, Russ. Uh, throughout history, what we've seen with entitlements is that if you provide a benefit, uh, you will end up uh, causing individuals to um, respond to the incentive uh, that the benefit provides, modify their circumstances so that they can qualify uh, for assistance. Um, and sometimes it borders on fraud. Uh, sometimes it, it's not fraud. It's just a, a modification in your behavior that's perfectly within the limits of the law. But invariably, the response by individuals to the incentives created by the availability of an entitlement uh, causes the uh, government to underestimate the eventual cost of the entitlement. It just reminds me one of the things I really enjoyed in the book were the quotes from various brave uh, senators typically or members of Congress, occasionally a president who would try to stand athwart the tide of expansion, whether it was Social Security or Revolutionary War pensions. And they'd say, well, you know, this is irresponsible. We know this isn't true. We're never going to do this, that, and the other that we claim we're going to do. And it's nice to have those – Heroic but uh, <laughs> ineffective uh, efforts uh, noted, and they're, they're, some of them are quite entertaining. I uh, just want to mention that. But one of the things I learned most from your book that I, I already knew in some dimension, but your book really brings it home, which I found very valuable, is that if you ask economists, and I think we often teach our, our students this way. I try not to, but I think it's a common, common approach. If we say, well, you know, what determines the size of government? Well, people will – in a public finance class, they'll teach the following. They'll say, uh, 
Well, we look at the things that the market doesn't do well, externalities, public goods, and that's where government has a role to play. And then we have to worry about taxation, how we're going to raise the money, and we try to do that in the most efficient way possible, and we try to spend the money as wisely as possible, et cetera, et cetera. But what your book shows is that that model of how government actually behaves not so accurate, particular in this – throughout really the whole history of entitlements, budget surpluses didn't ever – at least in the, your story, maybe you cherry picked, but budget surpluses never it, it caused politicians to say, "Well, hey, we can cut tax rates and give people back money to spend on their own." Instead, it's like, "Well, let's give away more money than we did before." And I, it's interesting. I think most people don't think about. I certainly don't always think about it. That in 1832, uh, there wasn't a lot of government revenue from anything other than tariffs. Was there any? What else was there? Money coming in for – there's no income tax. Where else did the federal government get its money besides tariff revenue? And what else was it spending money on besides these pensions that, as you say, were a quarter, which was kind of shocking, a quarter of all government spending at that point? Of course, it was a low level of total spending, but still 25 percent. So the, the tariffs were important. Your, your, your listeners might remember the, the Tariff of Abominations in, in 1828, which provided a significant uh, amount of tariff revenue. But the, the big bolus of revenues uh, in the 1830s and late 1820s came from land sales. Uh, the government oh, was yeah. offering up uh, lands in the western uh, regions, uh, and it brought in a huge, a huge amount of revenue. In fact, in 1832, uh, the um, surplus of revenues was more than twice expenditures. So there was this massive surplus. Uh, Andrew Jackson had uh, vowed that uh, he would use the surplus to extinguish the national debt that uh, that various presidents had moved to to reduce, uh, but he was going to extinguish it. And uh, and then, of course, we saw Congress's response to the um, to the surpluses, which was the tremendous expansion of the Revolutionary War pension program. Uh, but the vast majority of other spending uh, by the um, uh, by the federal government outside of pensions uh, was for national defense. It has always been, until the modern era, the principal um, uh, reason for government expenditures. In fact, uh, this 1832 or 1833 experience, where the pension expenditures rose to a quarter of the budget, that was. Only in one or two, two years um, after that, uh, the pension expenditures declined quite rapidly uh, and fell to uh, down below 10 percent of the budget uh, during the latter part of the 1830s, 1840s, and so forth. Um, and so there was a real spike in spending as a consequence of the benefits. It turns out that these benefits were made retroactive, uh, about 18 months of retroactive benefits, and that's what caused the spike. Uh, but most government expenditures back then and until, I would say, the 1970s were on national defense. So my favorite fact in the book – and this is great for cocktail parties, listeners. This is going to blow you away. It sounds, it sounds like it's, it's literally impossible. It can't be true, but it is true. We're talking – we're going to finish up our conversation about veterans' pensions, which is these, this early period of uh, – of the 19th century in, in entitlement spending by the federal government. Uh, the Civil War ends in 1865, and Union soldiers only uh, get pensions for – and you'll tell us how that evolved uh, in a minute. But think about this. That's 152 years ago, uh, and yet today in 2017, <laughs> or at least when you were writing your book – there is still someone receiving a pension from the Civil War. Now, a Civil War soldier, I guess, could have been 18, right. 17. I guess they could have lied about their age. They might be 16. But we're now uh, – that person 152 years later would have to be 168 years old. So no human being that we know of in modern times has lived to that age. So it seems to defy logic – that there could be anyone still receiving a pension based on their Civil War service, and yet we have the story of the great Irene Triplett. So tell us about Irene. 
Yes, a, a truly remarkable story of how uh, Congress, when it legislates entitlements, uh, uh, very often uh, cannot see where these entitlements will go. Um, so uh, Irene Triplett is, uh, I think she's 87, perhaps 88 this year, and she's still alive. She is the daughter of Mose Triplett uh, and his uh, wife, who was named Elida Hall and eventually Elida Triplett. But Mose was a – actually, he was a Confederate soldier uh, during the initial years of the Civil War, and he decided that he would uh, switch sides uh, near the end of the war. Uh, and then when Congress uh, eventually granted uh, disability pensions to virtually all um, Civil War uh, veterans, uh, Union veterans, uh, Mose received a, a pension. Uh, in uh, 1924, uh, Mose, who was at that time 78 years old, and uh, should married- be should be about to lose <laughs> the pension because he's going to die, and yes. that's it. 1924. <laughs> that would be a long time after the Civil War. <laughs> that is. So he married Elida Hall, and Elida was 28 years old at the time. And these, what we call these May to December weddings, actually were were quite common during the period. Uh, but as a consequence of uh, her marriage to um, to Moe's triplet, uh, she qualified for a survivor, a, a widow's uh, pension, uh, and so she collected the widow's pension. Uh, and then uh, in 1930, um, they had um, Irene as their firstborn, and um, Irene uh, then. Uh, collected a survivor's pension when her mother uh, passed on. And so that's the story. And here we are. So she's the only one. Two now. years later. There's only yes, one. She is, yes, yes, yes. Do, do you yes. know when the last one before Irene was? How long has she been? In other words, how long has she been the only Civil War pension recipient? So that's a very good question. I don't know, but I do believe that um, uh, there was a Civil War a widow, I believe, and perhaps uh, – I think I've got this right – who passed away um, just over a decade ago. Mm. And so uh, it, is, it is amazing how, how long these, these pension programs uh, uh, operate. When I, had, when I had started my work on uh, my research on these pension programs, I thought, well, they're different than the modern programs because eventually uh, they, uh, the expenditure will die off. The expenditure will recede as the population of wartime veterans for each of the wars uh, declines, uh, but eventually can be a very, very long time as we're seeing uh, with with the uh, Civil War pension program. Not, In fact, you go ahead. I was going to say one thing. Uh, uh, the Civil War pension program's expenditures peaked about 50 years after the Civil War ended. And so it was a consequence of ever – uh, incremental expansions of eligibility uh, that and benefit levels uh, that led to this um, growth uh, in the in the pension program. To give you some idea of, of how it worked, uh, let me take you a, a back a little bit. In in the early 1870s, um, let's say seven eight years after the war had ended, there were about 250 thousand. Uh, union veterans who were uh, on the disability rolls. And at that time, most members of Congress thought that this was the peak of the program, um, that anyone who had been disabled in wartime service um, would have come forth uh, to apply uh, for benefits. Uh, uh, Well, it turned out that that wasn't so. Uh, by the 1890s, so 20 years later, there were almost a million uh, recipients of Civil War pensions. And so the incremental expansions of eligibility uh, are reflected in those two numbers. And the, the thing I found interesting is that you know, they'd start off, you had to be disabled in the war. Then it would just, well, you were disabled sometime. You got drunk and you fell off your horse or whatever. <laughs> Then you still get a pension because that was – and that was a change. That wasn't like they pretended they got hurt in the war. They they liberalized the, the definition. I, I don't mean to push your expertise too far, John. I mean I've already – you know, trying to find the second uh, Irene Triplett. I apologize for not warning you before we talk, but I've got a tougher question for you. Yeah. Do you have any idea what Irene Triplett's benefit check is these days? <laughs> 
Yes, I do. I, mm-hmm. I can't say uh, too precisely, but I think it's it's a rather modest sum. I think it's around seventy two or seventy three dollars a month, and so it's very modest benefit. Because they made a mistake, from Irene's perspective, they never indexed it for inflation. That is correct. Which was not a mistake. That was um, that mistake was avoided by in the future. As we'll, we'll, maybe we'll get into that. Um, yes. So. Up till the Great Depression and the Roosevelt uh, administration, uh, most entitlement programs, maybe almost all, were, were of the, at the federal level, were of this nature. And it's important to point out, it, this is an aside, because when we, we, at some point we may be talking about anti-poverty measures. Of course, state and local governments were involved in anti-poverty uh, measures before the Great Depression. There was also a lot of private charity before the Great Depression. But what makes the Great Depression important among – you know, many many reasons, but one is it it's it's the point where the federal government gets deeply involved in anti poverty, uh, which ends up, in my view, killing off all private efforts to fight poverty and it, that had been in place before. You could debate whether they were successful, ineffective, whatever, but it certainly is a is a it's a watershed moment. Uh, how else did the Great Depression change? Of course, we got so security, we got. Many, many changes. So talk about Roosevelt's role in, in the process. So the um, – from a, from an entitlement uh, history standpoint, uh, the New Deal um, uh, did the following. Uh, as you said, Russ, prior to the New Deal, all of the major federal entitlement programs – were uh, programs uh, that benefited individuals that had performed some uh, form of government service, either veterans uh, or uh, civil servants. The unique feature of the uh, New Deal uh, entitlements were that they expanded the um, eligible group of individuals uh, for an entitlement program to members of the general population. Um, so if you turned age 65 and you had worked in a covered job, you were now eligible to receive a Social Security check. Uh, unemployment insurance was another example of an um, entitlement benefit for the general population. Same thing with, with welfare. And so when I think of the history of entitlements and the importance of the New Deal, that is, the, that is where the New Deal is profoundly uh, important. We saw in each of the earlier entitlement programs this tendency to liberalize the eligibility rules for an entitlement program so that it ends up covering almost anyone who could be remotely considered to be worthy of assistance. Um, And that force was now, with the New Deal entitlements, going to operate in a much broader and much bigger uh, way uh, as these entitlements applied to the general population. And so that is the very, very sharp uh, break from the past. Uh, In the past, it's also the case, as we said, uh, these entitlement programs for Civil War uh, veterans, for Revolutionary War veterans, eventually their expenditure subsided, although as we've said, it sometimes took a long time, uh, but eventually they would subside. Uh, with the New Deal entitlements, one cohort of recipients would replace another. The programs would become uh, permanent uh, with a stock of recipients replaced uh, uh, every every generation in the case of, of Social Security. Uh, and, uh, and so when you think about the dynamic of each entitlement expansion creating a new base upon which future entitlement expansions would be considered – now we're going to see with the with the New Deal entitlements and subsequent entitlements, this operate with a tremendous force, uh, causing entitlement uh, expenditures to grow enormously over the past 70 years. But there is something, again, a shocking thing I learned that I was totally unaware of, that a number of times uh, President Roosevelt was a vehement restrictor of government spending on entitlements and that he tried very hard and sometimes successfully at limiting entitlement expansions. Talk about what happened there. So 
Uh, Franklin Roosevelt was obviously a very, very complicated man, and, and we associate his, uh, his uh, tenure in office with uh, launching uh, the entitlement state. But the Franklin Roosevelt of 1933, uh, the year he took office, was a very, very different man. Uh, Roosevelt had uh, campaigned as what I would call a, um, an uh, orthodox economist. Uh, he believed that large budget deficits were a, uh, would, would do damage uh, to the economy. And so he had pledged to reduce government spending as a way of reducing the budget deficit. So when he got into office, um, veterans programs, primarily programs for World War I veterans at the time, were about 25 percent of federal spending. So one couldn't shrink government spending without taking on the veterans programs. And so uh, seven days uh, into office, uh, the president asked Congress if um, they would um, repeal – all of the veterans entitlement programs, um, except for the Civil War entitlement, but the entitlement for disability benefits to World War I uh, soldiers, to Boxer Rebellion soldiers, to the soldiers of the uh, Spanish-American War, and so forth. And uh, further, he said that Congress should give him the authority to uh, determine eligibility rules and set the monthly pension benefit. Uh, for uh, those who qualified. Congress, 10 days later, gave him that authority in what is called the Economy Act, or an act which is informally entitled, an act to maintain the credit of the United States government. And so within the next three months, uh, the Roosevelt administration um, uh, promulgated regulations uh, that restricted uh, eligibility for um, certain uh, types of veterans uh, and uh, reduced uh, benefit levels by as much as uh, 25 uh, percent. Um, so uh, what Roosevelt accomplished then over the next year was to reduce the veterans' disability roles by about 50 percent. Uh, a year after his regulations went into place, there were almost 400,000 fewer disabled veterans on the rolls uh, than uh, when uh, the law uh, had been enacted and the regulations uh, promulgated. Uh, that action uh, is the largest reduction in any entitlement program in American history, nothing uh, comes comes close to it. Uh, it was an extraordinary, extraordinary achievement for him, and one that you don't really read about uh, too much in the uh, in the history books about about the New Deal. And I have to say this about Roosevelt: um, he was a very, very um, tough uh, competitor. Uh, Congress, after after the uh, reductions have been taken. Congress passed numerous bills uh, that would overturn all or parts of the reductions that he had taken. And he vetoed one bill after another and badgered the Congress for their attempts to overturn his work. And, and uh, through the next seven years, um, he sustained these, uh, the action that he had taken in 1933. How did he justify those those uh, reductions in beneficiaries? I mean, it sounds like a horrible thing. People were disabled, and he's cut them off. What was the what was his story? What did he say? So, so the group that he was primarily focused on were uh, World War One veterans who were disabled, but their disability had not uh, resulted from their wartime service. So they had become disabled sometime uh, in the 15, 16 years uh, since, since the war uh, and had qualified for benefits. We, we call them non-service-connected disabled veterans. Uh, and Roosevelt's view was those soldiers um, had no uh, right to a, a disability benefit. Um, they, uh, the federal government owed them no uh, um, uh, benefits um, just for their service. Um, he believed in the idea of a citizen soldier. Uh, 
Um, in a time of war, all citizens were expected uh, to serve their country and defend their nation. If you were disabled during wartime service, of course, society was obligated uh, to take care of you. But if you came out of the war unscathed uh, and were subsequently disabled uh, while on the job in a manufacturing plant or on a farm or whatever, society owed that soldier no, uh, no, no assistance. And so that was his policy argument. It was really no different than uh, the, the policy that the founders uh, had uh, followed in, in deciding um, on pensions for Revolutionary War veterans. So it had a very, very long legacy. So that was the main policy argument he made. He was also made the case that the federal budget deficits would be the, eventually be the ruin of a country. Uh, and he made a strong case uh, on the general ground that the deficit had to be uh, reduced. Well, he wanted to spend that money on other things. Um, and of course, you know, that's in modern times what what has happened. We've made a massive um, dec- decision toward transfers and away from uh, things government used to do as, as large expenditures of money, um, at least in percentage terms. And we'll talk about that. Uh, we'll talk about that toward the end. But for now, I want to talk about Social Security which uh, really is uh, the more things change, the more they stay the same. Uh, although it's important to remember that when Social Security was first passed, um, there were only, this is, it's really kind of shocking politically. There were only taxes. <laughs> there were no benefits. <laughs> That's right. Yet. That's right. Now, the benefits that were paid, what, five years after the program was established? Yes. Were really quite spectacular for how much people had, quote, put in. Um but the original idea was it was a an insurance concept that you would be compelled to put aside money uh, and then the government would take care of you. And, of course, over time, that changed a lot. The connection between how much you contributed and how much you got back got looser and looser, and it became much more of a, uh, a, redistributive, a redistributive program. But I want to start in the early days. So in – when the program starts, I think in thirty six, is that correct? When the first taxes are collected, uh, thirty seven. Thirty seven. Yeah. Um, so passes, I think, in thirty five. Starts in some kind of thirty six. Taxes gets start collected in thirty seven. But nobody's going to collect a penny until forty nineteen forty one. Is that right? Right. 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 And in nineteen forty one, anybody who's eligible, and we'll talk about that in a sec, is going to get a very nice check, having only paid taxes for at most. Uh, four or five years. So, um, talk about the how the original coverage was set up and the original financing and how how small it was. I was shocked to read that even by 1946, only one in six workers overnight over 65 years of age were receiving benefits, and only one third of workers uh, were taxed. So there was a lot of coverage differences compared to today, where almost everyone is receiving and being taxed. So. Give us a little bit of that history. Right, so, so the program started out primarily for um, industrial workers, uh, and uh, large numbers of service workers and farm workers were not covered. Um, and so it was very, very confined to a uh, about uh, maybe about 50 to 60 percent of the workforce uh, was initially um, covered uh, by, the, by the taxes. And as you said, uh, individuals wouldn't uh, begin to collect benefits until uh, the early 1940s. Uh, for a person who was in that first cohort of recipients, um, uh, uh, on average, uh, they would uh, collect uh, in benefits – all of their contributions and their employer contributions in the first two months of retirement. And after that, they would be living on somebody else's dime. So from the get-go, we had this um, uh, transfer aspect uh, to to the program. And as you said, um, it was not that uh, – it was um, still an earned right program uh, in the 1930s, and it wasn't really until the 1950s and 1960s that it became what I think of as a, as a complete transfer program. Uh, but explain, what, of, explain that distinction. 
So in a, um, an earned right program or a normal pension program, uh, money would be uh, collected and set aside uh, and invested to finance the future uh, benefits to those that are now paying the taxes. Uh, a tax and transfer program is one where there's no money set aside. Um, the taxes that are collected today are used to finance the benefits uh, to retirees uh, today. Or other things. When there's a <laughs> surplus, which is what, of course, happened with Social Security. That's right. That's right. So it's very interesting. Um, Roosevelt's original idea was that the program be more like a pension, a pension program. And so initially, the taxes were set uh, much higher to generate revenues that were much higher than the uh, benefit outlays. And so a fund would be built up, a big reserve fund would be built up in the treasury. Uh, and that fund would then be, could be drawn upon uh, in 1980 or 1985 uh, when there was expected to be a large number of retirees uh, and, uh, and no uh, large increase in the debt of the United States government would be incurred. And so it was set up more, like, more or less like a pension uh, program. But immediately there were concerns that the money was being improperly used, that it was going to finance the general operations of government. Um, others on the liberal side said uh, that uh, this money that's being improperly used is being raised uh, through a regressive tax uh, and, uh, and therefore was unfair and that we should uh, use a uh, progressive uh, uh, income tax to finance uh, these, uh, these types of expenditures. And eventually Congress said, to heck with it, we're going to eliminate this large surplus that we built up. And they did so uh, uh, by uh, immediately expanding uh, the program to cover survivor benefits. Uh, the original law did not do so. Uh, and uh, they sp sped up the date at which the first um, retirees would be able to collect uh, their Social Security benefits. And, of course, they raised the benefit levels uh, for those that were nearing uh, retirement age. Um, and so they had responded to the surplus of funds just like Every previous Congress from the Revolutionary War uh, time to the present uh, had responded to large surpluses. They spent it. But since then, uh, Congress has established what they think of as a pay-as-you-go uh, pay um, policy. So the taxes that come, come in today go to pay benefits for those that are receiving uh, the benefits today. Uh, from time to time, we get spurts of economic growth as we did in the 1950s and in the 1960s and early 1970s, and surpluses have built up, and Congress has used those surpluses, as they had with the earlier pension programs, to expand benefits. But there is a, an illusion, and there is a theatrical aspect to this illusion that I did not realize, that the government invests <laughs> – <laughs> can't say it without laughing, and I, I, I hate I, it. Sounds disrespectful because there are people who will say with a straight face, very proudly and very adamantly, that the government invests that money, but it's a it's an accounting sham. So, uh, explain how that that sham works and the theatricality behind it, because it's really I was again surprised to, to discover it. I always thought it was a total sham. It's worse than that in a way. It's a it's a theatrical sham. <laughs> it truly is. The, um, uh, for years and years, all the Social Security Trust Fund was was a ledger uh, in, the, in the bowels of the Treasury Department. Revenues would come in to the federal government. With income tax revenues would be combined with payroll tax revenues. And the, the, the money is fungible. The treasury. Yes, and just, the accountants would just separate it out, put one uh, one pot of money, uh, the payroll taxes that they thought had come in. They would put that into uh, a line or a column uh, labeled Social Security, uh, and they would record the outgo from this uh, for this program as as in another column. Uh, and that's all the the Social Security <laughs> trust fund was. 
But they established this for the public, this elaborate system where they would list um, in every Social Security trustees report published annually, uh, they would list the uh, so-called um, investments that the trust fund had made in treasury securities. And the accounting is incredibly detailed. I mean, they will list um, uh, literally uh, dozens and dozens of securities uh, that have been allegedly uh, purchased uh, with, with these funds, when in fact the securities uh, that were quote unquote uh, purchased really, really never, uh, would never, never existed in the sense they were not marketable uh, treasury bills. Uh, the height of this, uh, of this folly or, or this story uh, comes uh, in the 1990s. Um, we had large economic growth um, from 1983 uh, through um, the early 1990s. And as a consequence, a, um, a, a trillion dollars of um, surpluses had built up into the Social Security Fund. And of course, these were all just accounting surpluses. The money had been spent on other activities of government. But in any event, uh, members would return to their districts and um, as the trillion dollar uh, balance in the fund uh, became known to the public, they would be confronted by senior citizens in their districts at these town hall meetings asking them, well, where is the trust fund? You know, you say there's a trillion dollars here, where is it? And so members came back to, uh, to Washington and the uh, leadership uh, decided that uh, they would create a social security trust fund. So they passed a law in 1994 that established the social security trust fund in a bureau of the public debt building in Parkersburg, West Virginia. And so the trust fund consists of a, literally of a file cabinet where a non-marketable securities are placed uh, each quarter representing the holdings of the social security trust fund. Now I wanna emphasize that these um, securities are non-marketable. <laughs> they cannot be sold in the market. Uh, they not, cannot be traded in the market. They are basically uh, uh, worthless uh, pieces of paper uh, th that are sitting in there. And people have asked me, why is, why is this trust fund in Parkersburg? And the answer is that uh, Robert Byrd at the time was the chairman of the Appropriations Committee. And Robert Byrd uh, is, uh, was a senator from West Virginia. And there just happened to be a nice Bureau of the Public Debt Building waiting for its second floor to be filled with some government activity. And so that's how we have the Social Security Trust Fund in Parkersburg. So the, just to make it clear, the, these, these so-called securities, these notes – uh, are pledges that the federal government will pay back the principal and maybe even some interest at times, I think, uh, to replenish and take care of the fund. But, of course, it's all just government money. It's not anything real that's set aside. It's just, as you say, a ledger, a transaction in the ledger that says, oh, yeah, you're, that money's there because the government's promised to pay it. But, of course, if the government doesn't have – the taxable capability to pay it, uh, those promises are not enforceable in any real way. I think that's right. And I think the important thing you said there, uh, Russ, was, was that there is a pledge, and all members of Congress have taken that pledge that they will uh, replenish uh, the, uh, the trust fund uh, by, uh, quote unquote, exchanging these securities for uh, general revenues of, of the government. Uh, but as you also said, there's no real economic asset there. The money has been spent. Uh, and um, uh, so all we have is a pledge. Uh, when people ask, where would we get the money um, that would be used to replenish um, the trust fund? Uh, the answer is, well, we have to go out and we'd have to borrow it in the open uh, public markets, uh, just as we would uh, if there were no, uh, no trust fund. security. <laughs> right. <laughs> exactly. Um, exactly. <laughs> so it, it's just, I mean, it's just fascinating. I did not know about that West Virginia building. So that's uh, <laughs> just, well, it's incredible. Um, if, if you get a chance, you should, you should go visit it. I, I, I do believe that George W. It's Bush a, actually went out and it's visited. It's a must see. It's definitely yes. a must see. <laughs> uh, right. uh, now, Social Security is, along with Medicare, um, going to cause some serious challenges potentially to U.S. Uh, fiscal stability in the future. Um, it's some, there's a point 
I forget where it is, you'll tell me, where federal entitlement spending passes defense spending as a proportion of GDP and now continues to grow while defense spending has continued to fall as a percentage to the point now where in 2017, if I have it right, it's something like uh, entitlement spending is about 16% of GDP. Defense is around three-something. Reverse reverse it. The defense budget is about one-sixth of GDP uh, defense is. Entitlements are about two-thirds. No, no, you're talking about federal spending. No, GDP. GDP Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Right? You're right. Yes, yes. Because – so you can tell it your way. Go ahead. So I was just going to say the the, um, uh, entitlements um, have profoundly changed the priorities of our of our government. Uh, As we discussed in the beginning of this uh, uh, of this uh, show, the um, defense was the primary responsibility of the federal government. And that was reflected in the budget where the lion's share of government spending was on national defense. Now it's completely flipped. Defense is one sixth of the total, and entitlements are about two thirds of the of the total. Um, entitlements, when you go back and look at their growth since uh, World War II, you find that all of the growth, all of the growth, Russ, in government spending relative to GDP, is a consequence of entitlement spending. National defense and spending on all other. Uh, programs uh, is about the same or a little bit less than it was in the late 1940s. So uh, when you think of entitlements as being a financial um, uh, issue, it is, but it's it's, it's also a uh, sort of a large governmental issue. You can't understand the growth in government without understanding uh, entitlements, and they have truly, truly uh, changed the priorities of our of our government from one that was primarily focused on national defense to one that's now primarily focused on uh, transferring uh, hundreds of billions of dollars from, from one group in society uh, to another group in society, and most often without regard to the financial need of recipients. So let me put on my progressive hat here, which doesn't always fit so well, but I'm doing my best. <laughs> uh, so one one view of this, uh, what I was about to say was that with the baby boomers starting to retire uh, today uh, and getting uh, having health challenges, the role of Social Security and Medicare at current benefit levels is going to be uh, increasing over the next 20 to 40 years such that there's some serious questions as to whether those promises at the current levels will be kept. Obviously, something's going to have to change. Either the taxes are going to have to rise or eligibilities have to be reduced, um, and we don't know what's going to happen. But let me, let me play the cheerful progressive, which is this is all good. You know, Your book's called The High Cost of Good Intentions, and I, high cost has two interpretations. One is just the budgetary cost, and I, the other is, though, is that it's costly and the more – uh, general sense of the word that it's that it's not always worth it. It's not always a good thing. But I would could argue, and I might argue that well, this is this is a good thing because look, we don't need as much government. We don't need as much defense spending as we used to. Uh, we don't need to have as big a standing army. The labor costs of defense are smaller. Yes, there's some technological things we want to continue to say to invest in, but those are uh, still going to be relatively small in terms of the total size of federal government today. Transfers, eh, they're just transfers. It's not its not regulation. It's not distorting. And what's the big deal? We'll solve this problem. Uh, we'll, we'll raise the retirement age to, to 70 because people are healthier. Uh, we'll raise the amount at which Social Security taxes apply as we've done already. We'll continue to do that. We'll raise that ceiling. And then finally uh, – We'll stop paying as much to people who have lots of money, which is nuts to my mind that we do that, and we'll solve this problem, and it's it's a good thing. There's not It's not a crisis. Uh, these expansions of eligibility that you're worrying about are not – they're not so important. It's, uh, it's just government moving money around. What's the big deal? 
so that is a uh, actually a very common view that that all we're doing is moving money around from one group in society to another, and that there's no uh, sort of social cost associated with doing so. Uh, but I think that's a that's that's a misguided view. Every dollar of an entitlement expenditure, um, regardless of how much it helps individuals. And, and believe me, in, in, in my book, I make the case that many of these entitlements, most of the entitlements, in fact, are uh, uh, quite, uh, quite beneficial to society in providing a safety net of assistance and in providing security uh, against, uh, against poverty. But the reality is balanced against that is every dollar of entitlement spending uh, ends up producing a disincentive for um, labor market participation, for work, for investments in human capital. And when you have an entitlement system that's as pervasive as ours, and so how pervasive is it? Well, uh, in 2016, over half of all households were receiving some benefit from at least one federal entitlement program. If we take out the households that are on Social Security and Medicare and we just limit the population to households that are headed by a person under age 65, the percentage of those households that are receiving assistance from at least one federal entitlement is 41 percent. And so these entitlement programs, every one of them contains, as I said, some work disincentive. Clearly, when you reduce benefits as income rises, as we do with our welfare programs, you create a work disincentive. When you provide disability assistance uh, to individuals uh, who are temporarily, marginally disabled, um, you create an incentive for individuals to claim that they are disabled uh, rather than uh, to engage in, in gainful work. Uh, Social Security and Medicare have become incredibly generous. Here's a fact that your listeners may not be aware of. The typical married couple that reaches age 66 today and begins to collect Social Security and Medicare benefits will receive on average, this is, receive benefits that total $50,000 a year. Now, the median household income of households under age 65 is not much higher than that. And so the transfer that is being made to senior citizens, who arguably are the uh, most well-off demographic group in America, is really, really quite, quite sizable. Um, the size of that assistance tends to create an incentive for individuals to retire a little bit earlier, uh, to go on part-time uh, employment, and therefore you lose productive workers from the workforce. The payroll taxes that are used to finance the transfer on working individuals in their 30s and 40s also creates a work disincentive or a hiring disincentive on the part of employers. Uh, and you end up with a system that is so large that it invariably now, I think, affects uh, the rate of growth of the economy as a whole. Well, I wanted to say something about Social Security tax. We got way late talking about uh, the lockbox trust fund. Um, <laughs> theater sham, but uh, one of the things that, that deeply bothers me is that uh, when we talk about tax reform, which is in the news today in 2017, right now, um, people forget that the payroll tax is part of our tax system. They think of that as this sort of separate thing that funds their old age retirement, which of course isn't true. That's again, a, that's a hoax. Uh, that's just literally a, a, an illusion. What it means is that uh, when you cut tax rates, if you're only cutting income tax rates, you're only going to cut them for the rich because the rich, certainly the top 50 percent pay the overwhelm. I think it's – is it 95 percent of all mm -hmm. taxes are paid by the top – of federal income taxes are paid by the top 50 percent. Uh, and so any tax cut is going to be skewed toward wealthier, richer Americans, higher income Americans. 
The problem is, is that we should be cutting taxes for everybody. Uh, the problem is that the income tax, most people pay zero now. Almost, almost half pay zero. And that leads to a world where government spending is seen to be quite cheap for most Americans because they don't pay for it. But that's a, that's a lie. That's, that's an illusion. In fact, every American, almost every, every working American pays a healthy amount of taxes through what is almost a flat tax, the employer and employee portion of the payroll tax, which is what, 15 plus percent right now? Do I have that number right? Yes, you do. So 15 percent tax rate. Of the combined per person, uh, employer and employee share, that's a serious amount of, of tax. And, but we don't think about that. And so we have this very unhealthy political dynamic. So, what, I, what I'd want to do, what I'd prefer to do is roll the uh, payroll tax into the general, into the income tax, eliminate the payroll tax, raise the income tax rates for some. They're paying them anyway, it's just they don't, they don't realize or they don't see it as dramatically or they think they're being, it's being set aside for them, which isn't true. Make force people to see that they're actually paying, which is a good thing. And then when you cut rates, cut everybody's rates. Cut cut rates of people who are making forty thousand a year but still paying paying their seven and a half plus seven point something plus their employers seven point something, which probably comes out of their their wages. And then you could have you could talk about real tax reform. But the current system. So the first point I want to make is that that's that's incredibly destructive, I think, to the political process. That dishonesty. Second point I want to make, and this is a subtler point. I apologize for lumping them together, but they go together in my mind, is that you're making the point, which I think is very important, that when we think of entitlement, we think of helping disadvantaged poor people, disabled people. Well, a lot of people who get these checks are not poor or disabled, like you say. They're wealthy elderly people who happen to have paid Social Security taxes when they were younger. Uh, however, if you're going to help the poor – uh, in general, you're going to have to structure a program if you want to have some kind of work incentive. You're going to have to structure that program so that some non-poor people, people above the poverty line, get some some portion of the benefits. That's not true of Social Security. That's not necessary at all. So I understand the argument that we have to help some people who are, say, 20 or 30, even 50 percent above the poverty line because if we phased out benefits sharply right at the poverty line – We'd kill the incentive to take work that paid just a little bit more than that because you'd be losing all your benefits. So we have to phase that in slowly or phase it out slowly, and as a result, some people above the poverty line get money that's supposed to go to poor people. That's inevitable in, in designing a, a anti-poverty program. But Social Security is not inevitable that everyone is entitled to it, uh, rich and poor. And I think that's just a terrible political mistake going forward, and I think – um, well, I'm done. I'm rambling on. So you, you can respond to any of that, all of it, whatever you want. <laughs> well, I, I couldn't agree with you more about Social Security being a uh, you know very, very different from the kind of program that would uh, protect individuals uh, from from impoverishment in old age. It's uh, really become uh, so distorted uh, over time, and and most of the Social Security money uh, has very, very little to do uh, with uh, with poverty alleviation. Aviation or poverty uh, prevention, uh, a very, very significant chunk of it and other benefits uh, go to individuals in the middle class. And when we start thinking about uh, how do we avoid um, this large increase in government spending that's coming as a consequence of the baby boomers retirement, we should be looking at Social Security and its structure, uh, both on the tax side, as, as you've pointed out, and on, on the benefit side. Um, you know, right now, we have a program that uh, the higher your wages uh, during your working life, uh, the more benefits you get out of Social Security. Um, so it, any inequality in wages during working life uh, translates into inequality uh, in retirement life. Uh, uh, most of the individuals that receive Social Security are not impoverished. And so the place to start, I think, is, as you said, with um, uh, going back to the original notion of Social Security, uh, which would be uh, anti-poverty program, and think about feathering down uh, the level of benefits uh, as, a, as a family's uh, income rises, uh, even during uh, their retirement years. When I make that observation, I always get the response back. But I paid into the program, and I want to, say, and I say, but you didn't. You, those <laughs> benefits went to pay for your mother's and father's Social Security benefit, not yours. 
And you paid into food stamps. You didn't get your money's worth out of that either. You paid into defense. You didn't always have to get to use that either. That's called taxes. It's the way the system works. Why you feel a claim on Social Security benefits simply because there was a program that alleged that you were putting aside money for your own retirement when, in fact, you weren't, unlike, say, your private savings, which, uh, yeah, that I'm going to take. <laughs> I'm happy right. to take that. I I saved. I, I did without consumption so I could have money when I got older. But the government forced me to pay for other people's benefits and the war in Vietnam, by the way, and other things that had nothing to do with Social Security. <laughs> they used that money for farm subsidies and everything else. And the fact that we had a thing that – we had a this theater that said it was for me is a – it's theater. So just get, <laughs> get with the program, folks. Well, he, and now my angry point. listeners over the age of 65 are going <laughs> to are gonna tell me that I'm wrong, but I, I, I think I'm right. Yeah, well, uh, the, the fact is that um, for today's retirees, they have paid only for about two-thirds of their Social Security and retirement benefits – uh, if you grant them the, the idea that they their payroll taxes were set aside, it would still be the case that uh, that if you only gave them what they paid in to the system plus um, you know a two or three percent rate of return, they would get only two thirds of the benefits that they're now getting. The second point, and I think this is really important for your listeners that that may be getting angry, um, is they have to think about who is actually paying for their benefits now. As you My said, kids. Russ, exactly, <laughs> that's exactly right. It's their kids, it's individuals that are in their 30s and 40s that are trying to raise a family, send their kids to school. That's where the money for their benefits is coming from. Uh, and if they keep that in mind, they might think, well, gee, uh, maybe maybe I could do with a little bit less of uh, my Social Security benefit if it results in a reduction in the tax liability that's levied uh, on uh, younger workers. But it has to be um, kind of together. There has to be a concomitant reduction in that payroll tax. And that might be a way of phasing it out and achieve your goal, uh, Russ, of, of getting rid of the payroll tax altogether and having a uniform uh, treatment of, of income for the purposes of taxation. I think it's appropriate this point in the conversation to quote uh, the great French economist Frederick Bastiat. He said, the state is that great fiction by which everyone tries to live at the expense of everyone else. And I think that's the worry for me. I don't, I don't know if – you know, when people worry or, or express concerns about the size of entitlements, I really do feel – you're denting me a little bit. But I generally feel that of all the things government does, giving money to old people is not the worst thing. It's um, – even with the disincentive to work, I don't, I just, I don't know how large that is. Uh, and I, I'm talking about the disincentive both to the recipients and the taxpayers who finance it, of course. Um, of all the distorting things the government does, transfers are I – I, I accept your point that it, there's, there is a distortion, but it's relatively small compared to certain regulatory interaction interventions and other uh, things that, that the government does. But I do worry about the long-term trends. So you know, if we think about – there's a lot of people interested now in a guaranteed annual income, a universal basic income, sometimes called, uh, where everyone, again, rich or poor, to avoid incentive problems, would get and phase out problems. Everyone would get a, 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 the same amount from the government. And I, there does – there is at some point a, play, a point where the government, quote, can't afford that and where more productive and legitimate uses of government money are not going to be available because the budget isn't there. Um, how worried are you about that, about the, about this entitlement train continuing to speed up and potentially creating something more catastrophic than just the distortions that you're worried about that I may be a little less worried about? Yeah, well, very concerned. Um, uh, there are about, uh, almost 50 million, uh, persons age 65 and older, uh, today in the United States. In 20 years, there's going to be about 80 million. So there's at least, issue. right? At least because yeah, very healthcare good point. might innovation might make that a bigger number. I don't know. 
I think you're right. I think it very well could run up uh, higher than 80, 80 million because of healthcare innovation. Um, that increase is going to drive federal spending, if we don't do anything about entitlements, um, to levels that are just unprecedented in all peacetime history of the United States. And it's not a temporary uh, expenditure. It's it's a permanent, large increase in, in government spending. In 15 years, if we tried to finance that level of government spending with taxes, you'd have to raise each and every tax in the federal tax code by 33%. Um, if instead you decided you were going to finance the increase in expenditures by debt, you would end up with a debt that is in excess of 100% of GDP. Now, I have to say the consequences of, of this are a little bit uncertain. That is, we're going into uncharted waters um, when we get to tax levels that high or debt levels that high. But I'd say this, um, economics teaches us that high tax rates of the sort that we would uh, experience um, are uh, detrimental to economic growth and detrimental to improvements in our standard of living. Um, history teaches us that uh, debt levels uh, in the neighborhood of 100% or more of GDP um, run the risk of creating uh, large uh, financial crises uh, for a country. Um, and so although we're going into uncharted waters, I think both economics uh, and history uh, should tell us beware and start taking action now. Uh, to rein in the growth of these entitlement programs so we, we don't end up uh, in either a uh, stagnating uh, economy with high tax rates and declining standards of living or uh, financial uh, crises. Um, and so the time to get moving is now. The ship of state moves very, very slowly, as, as, as we've seen. Um, and so the time to take on these entitlement programs is now before I would get to a point where they threaten our future prosperity. My guest today has been John Kogan. His book is The High Cost of Good Intentions. John, thanks for being part of EconTalk. Thank you, Russ. I've enjoyed it immensely and good to see you again. This is EconTalk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more EconTalk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.